We're going to be short today in terms of uh, in terms of the message that we bring. Um, I've been spending a lot of this past week writing uh, specifically on the topic of fasting fear. And honestly, the more I sit down to write, the more this thing just opens up in my heart. And I know the Lord is saying more than we have time to speak here in the services. And so we're going to be putting out an article, probably a series of articles. I've got about four of them going right now. Uh, and I'm just trying to edit them down to where they can be easily digestible and acted upon and incorporated in our life. Uh, but we're going to be sending out the first, the first article, the, the first part of this week. If you're not yet on our email list, I know for those of you who are visiting with us for the first time, you'll see a visitor card in that mug they gave you. If you'll fill that out and put your email address on there, uh, we won't bug you, but we will send you, when we believe the Lord is speaking something, whether in article form or there's an upcoming event or a special happening here at Kingsway Church, that allows us to get the word out to you about what we believe that God is saying and also what he's inviting us to be a part of. Uh, so be sure if you're not yet uh, part of that email list, you fill out that visitor card, you can drop them in the offering buckets and we'll get that out to you the first part of this week, okay? Now, uh, last Sunday morning, the Lord woke me up and he said, I want you to call a fast. And I said, Lord, it's barbecue season. I said, Lord, come on now. Is that the voice of a stranger or the voice of my shepherd? He said, I want you to call a fast. I want you to call a fast on fear. You see, in the word fast in the Hebrew means to cover one's mouth. And we've understood that word to mean to abstain from certain or all food and drink for a given period of time. And, 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 uh, and while that is application in the natural sense, I believe that what God is speaking to us here is being careful little eyes what you see, being careful little ears what you hear, being careful what we speak. Amen? And beginning to set a watch over our eye gates, our ear gates, and especially what we're pondering and meditating on, uh, and, and beginning to take captive in our life any thoughts the enemy would try to manipulate through our natural senses and how we perceive our surroundings to try to create fear in our heart, okay? How many of you remember last week we talked about the acronym that fear stands for? False evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. The enemy begins to try to, through manipulating our surroundings or our perception or perspective of what we see, hear, and think we know, he communicates these lies to our hearts that if we entertain them, if we agree with them, they'll actually produce behavior in our life that is not conducive to who we are and definitely not a part of where we're called to be. Because a lot of times we understand in the church sin to be, uh, to be defined by what you do, but I want to tell you sin has a whole lot more to do with what you believe in your heart than what you do with your hand. Romans 14, 23 says, whatever is not from faith is sin. And see, we've been trying in the church and in the world to modify behavior instead of transforming beliefs. Belief always produces behavior. So if we can get people to see different, that causes them to think different, and in turn believe different, they will then act different. Okay? We've been trying to do it from the outside in instead of the inside out. We've been trying to conform, and God has told us to transform. Amen. Okay? And so we spoke last week about this call to fast, this fasting of fear, uh, even as we understand fasting in the Hebrew to mean to cover one's mouth, David prayed a prayer in Psalm 141, verse 3, and this is what he prayed. He said, set a watch over my mouth and keep the door of my lips. And I believe that is part of the application because how many of you know having a fearful thought is not wrong? Acting upon the thought of fear is where we get into sin. When we allow fear to become the motivating, vo motivating voice and motivating force in our life, you can do the right thing from a wrong heart and it still be wrong. I love what Chuck Pierce talks about. He talks about how giving is a real motivating gift for him. But when he gives without joy, it actually gets him in a spiritual mess. But when he gives, how many of you know it says God loves a cheerful giver? Not one who, who is reluctant or under compulsion. We've said it before. If, we're, if we don't enjoy giving, we're not doing it right. Amen? Because giving is an expression of love. It's actually a connection between the love that we have in our heart and the one or the object or, 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 or what we're in love with. In fact, in Ezra 8.21, Ezra 8.21 talks about a fast that Ezra proclaimed. And this was the fast. He says, I proclaimed a fast at the river of Ahava. Say that. Ahava. Fun to say, isn't it? A hover. Show with somebody the other day. It sounds like a dip. A hover. 
But, but we actually have had, interestingly enough, I didn't know, I didn't know that they were thinking to name uh, Ahava this, but how many you know Josiah and Lydia Holmes? We had a baby shower for them a, a, a couple weeks ago, and, and they just gave birth. I think it was, was it Monday? Was it Tuesday? Monday at 1020, they gave birth to Ahava Ruth Holmes. Isn't that awesome? And so they're home recuperating today. But it's interesting when he said, I proclaimed a fast at the river of Ahava. Don't tell him I said it sounds like a dip. Hopefully they're not watching. I love dips. I'm a condiment guy. That's why I keep the beard. It's a condiment catcher. I sat down the other day to get just a little trim, and all of a sudden, before I knew it, they, whoo, 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 man, never get a haircut by a ninja. You take off one side, and then that's the other. Good old fly cut Jones hooked me up, shaped up my edges and everything. It was awesome. But anyway, Ezra proclaimed a fast at the river of Ahava, okay? And this was the fast he proclaimed that the Lord would give him guidance and show him and his people the way, the right way in which they should. Oh, Shaka Baba, we got the scripture right there. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves. See, because fasting humbles ourselves. Amen. The greatest act of humility is faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, and faith grows by obeying the voice we hear. That we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way. For us and our little ones and all our possessions. Notice they weren't just looking for any way. They were looking for the right way. Let's go to verse 23. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. Now, interestingly, it was, how many of you know, whenever specific names, proper names stand out in Scripture, typically that is the Lord wanting us to see something we would not otherwise see. And so we have to understand the importance of why they proclaimed a fast at the river of Ahava. Ahava means love. It actually means dearly loved. And it's made up of three letters in the Hebrew. The first two letters are known as the root for the word, okay? And those two letters actually mean to give. The adding of the third letter is what makes it love. And so what we see there is even as God so loved the world and gave his son, the one who is love to us, that when we take on a posture of giving, that that's actually not only born out of love, but it actually positions us at the place of love to receive from him the counsel that we're seeking in our day. So they proclaimed a fast at the river of his love. It also, if you look it up in the Blue Letter Bible, how many of you have the Blue Letter Bible app on your phone? If you click on Ahava in the Blue Letter Bible, this is what Ahava means. I shall subsist. Subsist. It's a fancy word meaning exist, be provided for, be maintained, be supported with provision. And it's interesting that we would proclaim a fast on fear on Sunday, and Ahava was born on Monday? The Lord is calling us, see, because perfect what? Love casts out fear. The Lord speaks to us on Sunday morning, call a fast against fear, and then all of a sudden, love is born on Monday morning. The very place that we're called to proclaim the fast and turn from fear to the Lord for his wisdom and his guidance in our life comes into our midst in a, in a, in a physical way. Isn't that awesome? The Lord is calling us to the river of his love. The Lord is, by the way, givers can always find the rivers. There's always, generous hearts can always find where God is at. That's why it's giving and love. Now, when I talk about giving, I'm not talking about just giving, to, giving of your finances. I'm talking about being a generous person, okay? Prosperity and poverty have very little to do with your, your bank account. They have everything to do with your mind. They have everything to do with how you see and how you think and what you believe, Okay? God is able, and God is faithful. Turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 3. I want to just look at the origin of fear, not just historically, but also in each of our lives. We're going to pray a prayer. The Lord's going to heal a bunch of people. And then we're going to go eat cake. Not me, though. Not me, because unfortunately, Sunday night, I, I say unfortunately, the Lord also, Sunday night after saying this thing about a call to fast Sunday morning, that Sunday night, the Lord says, I want you to go on a cleanse. Again, Lord, it's barbecue season. Like he doesn't know, right? He said, I want you to go on a, a cleanse, and I'm going to teach you some things about what I'm about to do with your body. 
You see, because although I've been told I may have some unwanted weight that I need to lay aside, it is swimsuit season. And we all have toxins we know that need to be flushed. The Lord is speaking something larger here. And while I appreciate the natural benefits that are taking place in my body and will take place as, as I commit to this discipline, even though it's not fun in the beginning, I know that it's speaking something larger to us as a body and his body as well, that it's time to put away toxic thoughts that cause us to talk sick. Because Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, he holds heaven and earth as a witness against you. Blessing or curse is life or death. You choose, and then he says, choose life so you and your descendants may live. That word lives means be revived, be made whole, be nourished, be preserved, be given promise to. Proverbs 18, 21 tells us what? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That word power in the Hebrew, one definition means the direction. In other words, which way is our, is our tongue pointed? Are we speaking toward life or are we speaking toward death? And also, it's time to lay aside some weight. Again, with this cleanse, it's time to lay aside the weight of negative thoughts and negative speaking, the weight of doubt and the weight of unbelief, so that we can begin to look unto Jesus and run the race that he has positioned us for with endurance and not grow weary, but begin to advance in this day. Again, we're going to be putting together an article that's going to go more in depth about this, but I wanted to let you know kind of where the Lord has us and what he's inviting us into. This fasting of fear is not just doing without fear, but it's actually feeding ourselves with faith. Feeding ourselves with faith. And we see the first mention of fear in the Bible connected to someone eating the wrong thing. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Again, we believe that this... This fast is a preemptive position to combat coming thoughts, schemes, and accusation of the enemy. The Lord spoke to my heart this morning in my office to tell you that this fast is both your exit strategy from the wilderness of where you have been and the entrance to your promised land. This fast, this fast on fear is both your exit strategy, your way to get out of the wilderness of where you've been, and it's also the entrance to your land of promise. How many of you understand the principle of first mentions in Scripture? Whenever something's mentioned the very first time, it sets a precedent for that thing for all eternity. And the very first time fear or being afraid is mentioned is in Genesis chapter 3. How many of you ever heard it said that, uh, that there's, 365, uh, there's 365 references in our Bible, in the King James, New King James, whatever you use, to either do not be afraid, fear not, uh, do, you know, uh, do not fear. How many of you know that? 365 references. One for every day of the year. Interesting, this morning on the way to work, the Lord said, what's my name? And he was like, what? What's my name? I was passing Dunkin' Donuts. I thought it was the flesh crying out. <laughs> Manager special? What's my name? And this is what the Lord is speaking, speaking to my heart. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Woo! The name, oh man, Rick Flair anointing just came on me. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Say that. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And the Lord spoke to my heart. I, I, I'm doing this personally as of this morning. I came in and started doing it this morning. I want to encourage you to begin to start studying the names of God. Because I believe that there are keys that can be found in the names of God as well as the nature of God that can combat each and every one of these lies of fear that the enemy would try to lay against you to where when he brings a lie, you say, when he tries to bring a lie of sickness to your body, like, oh, Jehovah Rapha, you take care of that. Are you with me? When he tries to bring thoughts of anxiety or terror or torment, Jehovah, Je Je Jehovah Shalom, take care of that. Amen. And then as I began to start thinking this morning, I was like, you know what? There are 365 references in the Bible to, to, to names and the nature that God calls himself. In other words, I am fill in the blank. And I want to encourage you over this summer to dive into the names of God and allow the nature of God to be formed in you. Now, some of you got to look for, they deal with the nature of God. Like, friends, I am Holy Spirit. I am Father God. 
I am the spirit of wisdom and revelation. It's not just Jehovah. It's not just, all, it's not just the seven names we're used to. Let's use this summer to get to know God. Because in the fasting of fear, not only is it opening up the floodgates for a summer of healing, it's also opening up opportunity for divine encounters as we move from a people who have known about God to knowing God on a first name basis. One thing that will really help your prayer life radically is just simply to quit calling Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit. Hey, well, does that matter? I don't know. When I changed it, it did. I don't know doctrinally, theologically, But when I went from talking about him as the Holy Spirit to Holy Spirit, it just put, man, how many of you just, hmm, hmm, how many of you have done this, okay? It's not a major thing, but it's a minor adjustment that I believe can produce great fruit. When you start talking, think about how much trouble, husbands, we would get if we called our wife the wife. I'm just saying, the wife. Ooh, man, I'm glad she's not in here. And I say, Tina, my wife, Holy Spirit, my friend. I also want to tell you this, the Lord's given us a new strategy for, for warfare. It's actually not a new strategy. It's probably the strategy you already always had. Uh, but, but, you know, a lot of times in warfare, we can be so focused on what we're warring against that we lose sight of the victory that's already been won. And this is where the Lord has had me, you know, again, we talked about last week, you know, to be anxious for nothing that, you know, that we're trying to medicate anxiety and it really needs to be repented of. He said to be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God and the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. In other words, the Lord has a better prescription for your life. It's called thanksgiving. It's called peace. But one of the things that's really been helping me, because how many of you had a, uh, a little, a little uh, fear craving this week as you begin to fast fear? Did, did, anybody have, did anybody have to come against any heaviness early in the week? Man, Lord, it was a doozy. Some people call it the June gloom, but I'm not going to give it a name. I don't believe we step back. I believe that, listen, it's a preemptive invitation to come back what the Lord knows is coming. And if we can position ourselves in a place of victory, we can rejoice instead of feeling rejected. We can rejoice because of knowing who we are instead of feeling rejected because of what we see happening to us in the midst of where we're at. And so this is what the Lord has been speaking to my heart. Instead of praying prayers against our surroundings and our circumstances and and spending so much time uh, looking at the darkness that would try to come against us, four words, the presence of Jesus. And I, listen, it has, all week long, the enemy will try to get us agitated. He'll try to speak things to our heart, try to get us to think about things that we're not called to think about. He'll try to get us to eat from the wrong tree. And there's something about just coming back to the tree of life, the presence of Jesus. And it reminds me of Zechariah 3. How many of you remember Zechariah 3? Joshua Joshua comes and he's standing before the Lord and Satan is accusing him before the Lord. And this is what the Lord says. He says, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. And see, I'm telling you, what positioned Joshua to see the Lord rebuke Satan was the fact that Joshua made the presence his priority. So many times in our life, we can be distracted by the accusation of the enemy and turn our heart to what is being said about us or, see, or what's being said to us and lose sight of the very one that we're called to worship. He said, listen, I'm keeping my eyes on you. I know he's over here running his mouth. I know he's saying all this and all that because the enemy will always try to take a little bit of truth and make it into a great big lie. He said, he's over here accusing me of this and that, but I'm looking to you, Jesus. I'm I'm, I'm focused on your presence. Your presence is my priority. And then all of a sudden the Lord said, the Lord, he says, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. I'm telling you, if you're ready for God to shut the devil up on your behalf, make his presence your priority. He began to speak to me. He said, Satan, shut up. Shut up. Dip it. Dip it. Dip it. And then what happened? 
the Lord said, hey, listen, let's put a new robe on Joshua. Let's take off the garment of heaviness and let's give him a, let's get, let's give him a, a, a new robe of praise. Let's put a new turban, which is a new way of thinking upon his life. And then he gave Joshua an invitation. He said, if you walk in my ways and you carry out my commands, you'll have free access in my house. You'll have free access among those who walk here. And I'm telling you, the Lord is inviting us to come up higher. And the enemy, through the lie of fear, would try to get us to be uh, 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 earthly minded and to drop our head in a time where the Lord is saying, come up here. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Ooh, man, I'm excited about this cleanse. Listen, some of us just need a good flush. We need to flush fear. We need to flush doubt. We need to flush unbelief. We need to flush negativity. We need to flush toxic thinking, and then we will no longer talk sick. I'll tell you, if we want, how many of us want more authority in our words? Listen, for a lot of us, if the Lord would put his weight in our words with what we used to say, we'd kill somebody (laughs) on the way to work. God is wanting to put his weight in your words, but you've got to think his thoughts and walk in his ways to position your words to carry his weight. He's going to bring increase of anointing, increase of authority, but it's connected to this cleanse. It's connected to this fast. Why is it so important to not doubt? James chapter 1, verse 5 says this. He says, if any of us lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, Right? But listen, you can, you can insert whatever you lack in the place of wisdom. If you lack, ask God. If you have need of, he says, we have not because we ask not, amen? And then we have not because we ask amiss. We ask according to our own desires, our own ambitions. But if we ask according to his will, we have the confidence that he hears us and that he's going to answer us. But he said that if, if any of us lack, let us ask. 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 Because God would give liberally without reproach. But then he said, for those who ask, let them ask, not doubting in their heart. Why? Because a man who doubts, a man who doubts, a man who doubts is like, uh, is like a ship tossed by the wind, tossed by the sea. He's double-minded in all of his ways. He's so distracted by plan B's, plan C's, and plan D's, he's forgotten the plan A. He said, let not a man who doubts expect to receive anything from God. I want to tell you, if we can begin to, to, to deal with doubt, if we can begin to uproot, if we can flush our doubts and feed our faith, the prayers you pray will be answered like that. In other words, how many times do we pray a prayer with reservation? Lord, it'd be really nice if you did, but it's okay if you don't. We need to deliver that. We, we need to get that. We need to flush that from our system. <laughs> Flush. Get it, get it gone. Flush it. What about unbelief? Mark chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Here we are moving into a summer of healing. Mark chapter 6, this is a paraphrase. Uh, it talks about how the Lord could do no mighty works in Nazareth except for lay hands on a few sick that they may recover. And then what did he do? He marveled at their unbelief and went back to teaching. You know why? Because he knew that if he could continue to teach them, he could uproot their unbelief by beginning to put his finger on their lie. But doubt and unbelief must be uprooted from our life. They must be dealt with. They, along with negative thoughts, negative speaking, and plan Bs rooted in uh, what we can accomplish in our own strength outside of the will of God, they have to be flushed. They have to be dealt with. They have to be put away for us to walk in the fullness of what we're called to walk in. Are you with me? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to create a little bit of doubt. Trying to create a little bit of doubt. Has God indeed, has he really said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And I'm sure he had some voice inflection when he said that, of every tree? Because actually the Lord had said what? You can eat of every tree except one. 
Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You will be like God, knowing good from evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And see, what the enemy tries to do is he tries to entice us. He tries to entice us by making... uh, making sin look desirable. That, but somehow uh, putting something in front of us that maybe God didn't really want, um, maybe God didn't really want the best for us. He begins to start creating doubt in our heart about the Lord's heart for us. And what it does is it actually causes us, it causes us to, to entertain thoughts that the Father is not thinking toward us. You see, she began to start entertaining and agreeing with thoughts that did not originate in the heart of the Father. And I want to tell you this this morning. When we entertain thoughts that the Father is not thinking toward us, we have already eaten fruit from the wrong tree. I'm going to say it again. When we entertain, when we begin to think thoughts that the Father is not thinking toward us, we've already eaten from the wrong tree. Let me tell you his thoughts. Jeremiah 29, 11 is still his thoughts for you. Still his plan. He said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. There are thoughts, there, there are thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. So any thought that is connected to hopelessness is from the wrong tree. Any thought that would come against your peace is fruit from the wrong tree. He tries to get us to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil instead of coming to eat in the tree of life. What the serpent was going after here was he was going after what Eve believed about God and what she then in turn believed about herself. Simply put, belief produces behavior. And as we know, whatever is not from faith is sin. We understand that fear, hear me when I say this, fear is the root of pride and it is planted in self-centeredness. Fear is the root of pride. It's planted in self-centeredness. And knowing that will help us to assess the thoughts in our life that need to be weeded out so that faith can grow and reproduce the fruit of the Spirit and the nature of Jesus in our life. Fear will cause you to do things that your rational self would never do. Believing a lie produces a behavior that is beneath the standard that God has called you to live at. Are you with me? But many in the church and many in the world are living in a place of bondage and fear because they do not know who their father is. And they do not know what their father says about them. Two things the Lord spoke to me on the way here this morning. One, what's my name? Began to start speaking about the importance of knowing the name of the Lord and it being a strong tower that we can run to when the enemy brings a lie against us. The other thing he said was, who's your father? Who is your father? Who's your father? And see, the world has listened to the father of lies instead of the father of lights. James 1.17, James introduces us to the ministry of the father of lights. He says, every good gift and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation. There's no shadow of turning. He doesn't change. He's always good. But Jesus also spoke about the father of lies in John chapter 8, verse 44. As he was speaking to the Pharisees, he says, you you are of your father, the devil, and it is your will, speaking to the Pharisees, to practice the lust and gratify the desires which are characteristic of your father. In other words, to feed on forbidden fruit, to feed on the very things I've told you not to do because I know that if you do them, it will hurt you. 
How many of us as, as good mothers and fathers, we don't tell our kids not to do something because we want to withhold some good thing. We tell them not to do something to protect them from what could happen if they did. We, we, tell, we want to protect you from hurt. If you knew the outcome and the consequence of the choice you were making, you wouldn't make the choice in the first place. Speaking of the, of the enemy, he says, he was a murderer from the beginning and God does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a falsehood, he speaks what is natural to him for he is a liar and the father of lies and all that is false. Fear is at the heart of the orphan spirit. Fear is at the heart of the orphan spirit. And what was happening here in Genesis chapter 3, Eve, a daughter of God. I mean, you don't, get, you don't get that much more plugged in the family line than Adam and Eve were. Jesus is it. Daughter of God, through a lie, the enemy tricked her. He deceived her into giving up her inheritance and becoming an orphan. To begin to think with an orphan mindset, and to begin to act like an orphan. Remnants 8.14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. I want to tell you this. Sonship, now hear what I'm saying. Sonship has a lot more to do with who you are following than simply a prayer you have prayed. Sonship, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Walking as a son, living as a son, in relationship with your father is more than just praying a one-time prayer. Because there's a lot of people that have prayed a prayer that are still living as servants. Some are living as friends, but few are living as sons. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. By whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And when Eve began to listen to the lie, she began to eat fruit of the wrong tree. Let's look at verse 7. Genesis chapter 3. We pick it up. Adam and Eve have eaten of the fruit. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Their eyes were open, and they knew they were naked. They had always been naked, but up until then, their eyes had been on him and not on them. Eating fruit of the wrong tree causes you to take your eyes off of him and put them on you. And you will always see what you're lacking when you do that. They made coverings out of what? Fig leaves. It's an acronym. Fear, insecurity, and guilt. And people try to, when they begin to eat from the wrong tree, by beginning to believe the lie, by beginning to agree and entertain with who the enemy is saying they are and what he says God will not do, and they believe the lie, they adopt the lie, all of a sudden they begin to start trying to cover up with fear and insecurity and guilt, and the Lord doesn't quit showing up, they quit showing up. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves coverings, and they heard the sound. Whoo, man, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Where are you? See, we like to think that sin causes God to back, for, back up from us, but that's not it. Eating fruit from the wrong tree will never cause God to back away from you, but it will cause you to back away from God. They hid from him, but he still showed up at the same time to walk with him. He said, I love you. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here. Repent. Think different. Come back to me. I love you. So he said, Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. First mention of fear in the Bible. He ate fruit from the wrong tree when he believed the lie, when he engaged the accusation, when he began to doubt the heart of the Lord toward him, fear entered his life. 
So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate it. One of the first things that fear does is it blame shifts. It tries to get it. It wasn't me, Lord. It was her. You gave her to me, so it's your fault. Anybody that doesn't take ownership for what they've done is gripped by fear. You can't disown a problem until you own it. You can't lay it aside until you know you got it. And the Lord God said to the woman, what, what is this you have done? So merciful. The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Again, she shifted the blame. It wasn't me, it was the snake that you put here. It was a bad snake. It wasn't like a rat snake or a king snake. How many of you, by the way, just have an uncontrollable fear of snakes? We're all going to Maxine's house just to get delivered of our fear of snakes. Maxine is just such a lover of all God's creation. She can find beauty in everything, and that is a wonderful, wonderful trait. Amen? Anywhere we have fear in our life, it's evidence that we have eaten from the, from the wrong tree. But I want to tell you this morning, I want to tell you this morning, all you got to do is spit that fruit out. And so here's what I want to do. The Lord's about to heal some folks in here. Again, we're going to, we, we couldn't even scratch at the surface of what God is speaking right now about fear. But, but how many of you, the Lord shine, shone a light this morning on some things that help you to understand areas where you can fast fear and you can begin to do without doubt. Amen? Listen. You've, ever, you've already won. You've already overcome the world, but the victory you've overcome is your faith. And that's why, see, if the enemy can get you to give up your faith, you've given up your victory, and then he makes you think that he's overcome you. But he's a liar. He's a liar. It's who he is. He can't help it. Poor guy. He's a liar. He's a thief. He's a murderer. He's so small. He's so little. He's so pathetic. It's so sad. It really is sad. Job said it like this. He said, for the thing I greatly feared has come upon me and what I dreaded has happened to me. The fear of loss actually becomes a magnet for loss. The fear of loss is the greatest enemy against our ability to freely receive what God has freely given to us by the gift of grace. And the same way that faith positions us to receive the covenant blessings and prophetic promises of the Lord, fear attracts the very things we fear the most. We talked last week that it's been proven that 50% of medical students end up getting the symptoms of very disease, the very disease they are studying. It's the principle of becoming what we behold. But could it be that when we spend a significant amount of our time and the meditations of our heart focusing on the very things we fear, that the fear we have attached to these conditions actually empowers and grants them permission in our lives? For instance, you... All of a sudden, the enemy comes with you to lie. You're not going to be able to pay your rent. You're not going to be able to pay your mortgage. Uh-oh, that's a funny-looking mole. Could be skin cancer. This is how it happens. You walk into a room, they're talking about you. No, they're not. They're talking about playoffs. How many of you, how many of you, you walk into a room and people are talking, you all, I won't ask for a show of hands. Just answer it within your heart. You walk into the room, you see people talking, and you're like, I wonder if they're talking about me. That is, listen, that is like a neon sign of insecurity. And I'm telling you this, the Lord, shukarababa, hear my heart. I love you, you know I do. I weep for you at night, and I wake up praying for you in the morning. Listen, I'm telling you this. The Lord wants to put his finger on that and for you to realize how stupid of a lie that is. Fear is rooted in pride. And it's sown in self-centeredness. But how many conversations are we missing out on engaging in because we think they're talking about us and we shrink back? Not in every case, but in most, but not in every case, not even in most cases, but in many cases, people are getting sick because of the thoughts they think, the words they are speaking, and the meditation, the ponderings of their heart. The great thing is, if this is the case in your life or the life of someone you know, all they have to do is repent Think different and break agreement with that lie to receive your healing.
to receive your breakthrough, to receive your deliverance. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer. We're going to pray a prayer. We're going to release you. But if you, if you have experienced an onslaught of fear, the enemy asking what if questions, what if questions in your life that are connected with anything but peace. They're connected with evil, not good. I want you to stand up. We're going to pray a prayer. We're going to break this off your life. You're going to align yourself with him. And when you do, this thing is going to leave you. Asking questions. Well, will you have enough to do this? All of a sudden, just like those medical students, you begin to start taking on the the symptoms of the very things you don't want to have. Not because you have it, but because you've been afraid of it. If you've been gripped by fear of coming down with a certain condition, infirmity, or disease, I want you to stand up. Heart disease in your family, cancer. You see something on the news and all of a sudden you're worried you're going to get it. Remember how much of a mess they made out of Ebola for a very isolated incident? They love to blow small things way out of proportion. Here's what we're going to do. If this is for you, if in any way you've believed a lie that has been acting as a magnet and an attachment for the very thing you fear the most, I want you to pray this with me. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you have given me the mind of Christ and that your blood is flowing through my body right now. In the name of Jesus, I break agreement with the lie of now this is where you'll fill in the blank whether it's cancer migraine headaches glaucoma poverty whatever lie break agreement right now i break agreement with the lie of you're going to start speaking it out right now and i receive my healing i receive my breakthrough I receive my deliverance now as I align my spirit, my soul, and my body with your word for my life. I was not created to fear. <laughs> Woo, that felt good. Say it again. I was not created to fear. I was not born to fear. I was born to do great things. I am full of faith. I am full of hope, I am full of love, and I am full of the Holy Ghost. I know who my Father is. I know Him by name, and His nature is in me. Devil, shut up. In Jesus' name. Let's worship. (laughs) Come on. You will unravel me. Your melody, you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. You unravel me with your melody. Surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies until all my fears are gone. Chosen me and love. 
to your family your blood flows through my veins
the name of Jesus all across this room, I ask you by the work of grace to remove the taste for fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil from our mouth and from our life. That we would no longer even have a desire to see things that way. Right now, if you want that, just put your hand on your mouth right now. Say, Lord, take away my taste for fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask for you to put your heel on his head to crush the head of the serpent in the life of each and every person here in Jesus' name because you are no longer a slave of fear. You are a child of God. protection, God. Oh 